Welcome to 10 Songs, where each week we dive into the connections to the music that you love. From cover versions and little known gems to those tracks you just skipped over. We'll show you the common thread across the music you love today and help you find a new favorite with just 10 songs. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this episode of 10 Songs. I'm your host, Stephen Rose. On vacation is Peter Rising, and it is well deserved. So we're looking forward to having him back for our next show next week. This week, before we begin, I do want to put out the warning that there may be some graphic language because we are talking about Lou Reed. Yes, Lewis Allen Reed. Lou, uh, 1942 to 2013, his life was cut short, uh, sadly, by cancer. Uh, he was born in New York, but he is considered one of the innovators of proto-punk, glam, art rock, noise rock. If Bruce Springsteen is the voice of Blue Collar, uh, you know, New Jersey. Then Lou Reed is his New York doppelganger who sings for folks who are caught under the shoe of New York City life, from prostitutes to drug dealers, transvestites, transsexuals, to the poor and forgotten. They are his muse. He is their voice. He is the mayor of the island of misfit toys, and those who were part of that society loved that he was their voice. Um, before we begin... Go listen to two albums. Go listen to a second album, Transformer, and listen to New York because they are by far, at least I feel, his best work. And I could do nothing but play just tracks off that album to make up the top 10. As a matter of fact, it was very hard to only pick two from both of those albums to be on here because there were so many amazing tracks. But it's like saying, hey, um, you know, what pizza is good? Well, Bad, even bad pizza is good pizza, but great pizza is Transformer and New York. So go listen to those two from end to end. They're amazing. I'm not going to be able to cover. Some people are going to say, why didn't you pick Vicious or Straw Man or Last Great American Whale or Good Night Ladies? Or, and I know I'm going to get that. So if I could, I'd just say those two albums and be done. But that wouldn't really make for a very good podcast. So we're going to move forward. Lou is easily one of the greatest American poets ever. He's like Bukowski meets Edgar Allan Poe on a good day. His lyrics are haunting um, and truly memorable. Uh, he even printed a book of his lyrics and it stands as a phenomenal poetry book. Finally, Lou Reed, uh, by many people, it has been said that he is the first queer icon of the 21st century. Uh, even though later he married Laurie Anderson and was with her for eight years before his death, he was not married before that, and he had a myriad of relationships with a variety of different people. But um, let's take a quick look back. How did Lou get his start? Well, he was part of the Velvet Underground, uh, probably one of the most influential bands of the late 60s, uh, bringing unique sound, John Cale and his violin, uh, Nico, the singer from Germany, um, you know, a, a female drummer, Andy Warhol uh, doing Exploding Plastic Inevitable, uh, you know, with movies on them and the whole thing. So um, we'll do a separate under, a separate episode on the Velvet Underground and really dig into that. But um, the songs that he did there very much influenced who he would become later. Lou had 20 studio albums. And as I said, in 2008, he um, was married only once and it was to Lori Anderson, who was with him until his death so song number one uh we're going to start with walk on the wild side probably the song that more people know by lou than any other track out there it is um it was his biggest hit but it was a counterculture anthem um you know it talked about trans transgender people it talked about drugs male prostitution oral sex and it's all about people who were regulars at andy warhol's factory um, this album uh, was released in 1972. It was produced by David Bowie and Mick Ronson. It was Lou's second album, and uh, it's a brilliant album. Bowie, Lou had learned a lot from Bowie, and his sound was definitely influenced by Bowie, but Bowie learned a lot from Lou, and um, that really comes together in both of their albums that followed up with this. Um, so a little bit of background on it. Uh, they talk about Holly. Uh, Holly came from Miami FLA. She was a transgender actress called Holly Woodlawn. Um, Candy Darling was also a transgender. 
Uh, little Joe Dulles, uh, Little Joe is Little Do Joe D'Alessandro. He was a teenage hustler and the star of Andy Warhol's movie Flesh. Uh, Jackie, Jackie once never gave it away. Jackie Curtis, who was a Warhol um, actress, and the Sugar Plum Fairy was a guy named Joe Campbell. The song is based on a 1955 novel by Nelson Algren called Walk on the Wild Side. And the sax in this, which is probably one of the most memorable parts at the end of the song, was done by Ronnie Ross, who taught David Bowie. So when you hear the song All the Young Dudes, which Bowie wrote for um, uh, Ian, um, Ian Hunter. Ian Hunter? Now it's bugging me. Yes. Hang on. Now I need to double check. Hang on. Dudes. Mata Hoople. Sorry, Mata Hoople. I knew that was wrong. So, yes, so that he wrote for Mata Hoople and Bowie plays saxophone on that. He was taught by the amazing um, Ronnie Ross, and Bowie continues to play saxophone for many years. It's also been a highly sampled song. Um, Tribe Called Quest, Can You Kick It, uses the Lou Reed lyric, as does a horrible song by Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. But um, it was released as a double A side, but the song Perfect Day, which is also a brilliant track. But the lyrics, the lyrics are what make the song and they are absolutely groundbreaking and incredibly risque for this time. They were did stories that weren't told in rock and roll. Um, and Lou thought that would be kind of fun to introduce people to characters that they hadn't met before or hadn't wanted to meet. Walk on the Wild Side, as I said, was a worldwide hit. The single peaked at number 16 on the Billboard Hot 100 singles charts in early 1973. And um, it's just a brilliant, brilliant song. Um, there was a regular version and a censored version because Lou said the term colored girls, so that was an issue. Um, the issues to oral sex. So they changed the line color girls to and the girls go. But hey, leave it to the UK who played the regular version. and. With it. So Lou Reed's first big hit, uh, his probably most known song to date, and uh, the top track from his second album, Transformer. Let's take a listen to Take a Walk on the Wild Side. All right, Lou. Yeah. Huh. They even use that um, for a advertisement for Yamaha scooters back in the 80s. Uh, if you need to go take a look at that. But uh, it's also where I think he says they refer to me as Yamaha. -pi. But he was a big motorcycle guy, not really a scooter guy, but a motorcycle guy. But it uh, it made for a really great um, ad. So, all right, welcome to the Wild Side. Track two, also from Transformer, is Perfect Day. Um, Perfect Day was written after Reed and his then fiance, uh, Betty Kronstadt, spent a day in Central Park. The lyric is also considered to um, suggest simple, conventional, romantic devotion. Um, you know, it alluded to Reed's relationship with her and Reed's own conflicts with sexuality and drug use and ego. It was um, uh, released as a charity single for children in need in the UK and went on to become number one for three weeks and it raised over two million pounds, which really speaks to the power of such a great, beautiful song. Uh, soon after Lou's, Lou Reed's death in 2013, Cardinal Gianfranco Ravisi, the Vatican's culture mi new, uh, minister, made news by tweeting songs from the lyric. He did, oh, it's such a perfect day. I'm glad I spent it with you. Oh, such a perfect day. You keep me hanging on. Uh, there are some amazing cover versions by Duran Duran and Christy McCall and the Pogues, Evan Dando from Levenheads um, did tracks to this. But it is a beautiful, beautiful song uh, in the midst of a um, amazing album. So let's listen to Perfect Day by Lou Reed, and that will end our area on Transformer. But once again, go listen to the full album. It's brilliant. Truly one of his greatest works. I'm wearing the T-shirt today. Go listen to Transformer. So let's take a listen to... Lou Reed, perfect day. All right, we're moving in a very different direction. Uh, his next album, Berlin, um, was a very dark album. He was living in Berlin at the time with Bowie and with Iggy Pop, 
They were doing a lot of drugs, and he decided, I want to write a concept album about couples struggling with drug addiction and abuse. Uh, the album, while not well received in 1972, was listed as number 344 of the greatest 500 albums of all times. This is a difficult album to listen to because the lyrics and the music are two totally different things. Carolyn Says, which is a beautiful song, is about a woman who's beaten by her drug addict husband and wonders why she still stays with him. Uh, how do you think it feels? You know, uh, how do you think it feels when you've been up for five days? Come down here, mama, hunting around always because you're afraid of sleeping. And when do you think it stops? These really super dark lyrics are over this amazing guitar and horn arrangement that is almost celebratory, uh, that is uplifting and happy over these super dark lyrics. So be aware, Berlin is one of those albums you don't want to listen to if you're in a rough place or a bad mood because it's a heavy, heavy, dark, serious album. But it is one of those albums that if you sit down and you listen to it with headphones on, you will get taken away and you will see another side of life that you may never hopefully be privy to, but is fascinating to look into and gives you empathy for the common man. So from the album Berlin, how do you think it feels? All right, that was number three. We move on now to 1978 and the album Street Hassle. Um, this is a great album. First of all, it was the first binaural recording. And by that, I mean that there's two mics in the room to mimic stereo, which is optimized for headphones. So as Lou sings and talks in different directions, the different mics will pick it up. It doesn't really work very well when you're listening to it through a regular radio. But with headphones, it really does something unique. Um, the album combined some live concert tapes and studio recordings that they went back and they remastered. Uh, Clive Davis, the very, very famous Clive Davis, who worked with Lou and founded Whitney Houston and is just considered one of the modern great masters of music, um, geared the recording, uh, no, sorry, heard the recording and encouraged Lou to focus and expand on the title track, Street Hassle. Uh, and it ended up turning into a three-part suite, um, about 11 minutes in length. The first part you'll recognize as uh, Waltzing Matilda. The second part, part B, is Street Hassle. And the third part is a movement called Slip Away. Now, the lyrics, you know, some people got no choice and they can never even find a voice to talk with that they can even call their own. So the first thing they see that allows them the right to be, why they follow it, you know, it's called bad luck. What's phenomenal was at the end of that third piece in Slip Away, he throws in the lyric, Tramps Like Us, We Were Born to Pay. Uh, very much sounding like Springsteen's Tramps Like Us, Baby, We Were Born to Run. Now, what's interesting is Springsteen was downstairs working on Darkness on the Edge of Town. Lou went down to him and said, hey, uh, I've been told I can't use this lyric. Are you okay if I use it? And Bruce goes, yeah, of course, man. You're, you're Lou Reed. Uh, and Lou said, hey, why don't you come down and sing the lyric? Uh, you know, we can't give you credit on the album because you're on a different label than I am and it could create issues. And Bruce said, absolutely. So if you listen um, very, very carefully at the end, you will hear Bruce Springsteen sing the line, Tramps Like Us, We Were Born to Pay. Now, the album itself was motivated by the end of his three-year relationship with Rachel Humphreys, who was a trans woman who died of AIDS in 1990. Uh, and the album is a requiem for their relationship and very um introspective of what happened uh, there's also a great cover of this track by simple minds um so let's listen to street hassle by lou reed from the album street hassle all right moving on to number five we jump all the way to 1984 Lou had uh, arguably some mediocre albums in that time. There are, of course, some shining star tracks uh, on Blue Mask and other albums. But overall, his work was not to the level that he needed it to be, really because he was um, drunk and high and going through a lot of addiction and withdrawals and heroin and a lot of stuff. But Lou started to clean up his act in 1984, and it allowed him to write a really brilliant album 
called New Sensations. Um, and it is one of my uh, favorite albums also of his, probably number three or four. Uh, had some songs, um, you know, My Red Joystick, which uh, actually became a single. He, um, you know, Fly Into the Sun, My Friend George, I Love You Suzanne, um, Turn to Me, one of the greatest songs ever about friendship. Absolutely love it. But New Sensations is one of those songs that when I hear it, it just puts me in an amazing place. What makes it great? It's stripped down simple. There is this phenomenal Fernando Sanders fretless bass line. Lou sings with a warmth and humanity that none of the critics thought that he could. I could recite all the lyrics from that song by heart, but some of my favorites, I think, that really give you an idea of where his head's at are, um, I don't want pain. I want to walk and not get carried. I don't want to give it up. Huh, I want to stay married. I ain't no dog tied to a parked car. Want the principles of a timeless muse. I want to eradicate my negative views and get rid of those people who are always on the down. It ain't enough to tell what is wrong, but that's not what I want to hear all night long. Some people are like human to an alls, which is a drug. So Lou Reed drove through Pennsylvania through the Delaware Gap. Took JPZF for a ride. I love this song. I truly, truly love this song. And I think it's one I want you to sit back and not do anything for the next five minutes, 45 seconds, and just listen to the song. Let the bass line take you and just listen to a story about Lou reflecting on life as he rides his motorcycle on a Sunday afternoon uh, in the Delaware area. New sensations. I love that song so much, and it is on so many of my favorite playlists, and um, uh, definitely one of my favorite Lou Reed songs. Lou Reed had a sister, Meryl Weiner, uh, who ended up becoming a psychotherapist, and it was hard for her watching Lou go through all of the things that happened between the drug addiction addictions, between all of that stuff, but... Um, he was asked to be in a movie called Get Crazy, which if you have a chance to watch it, I will warn you now, this is not a great movie, but it is a very funny movie, and it is absolutely an 80s movie. It has a great um, performance by Rodney McDowell. It has a awesome performance by Lee Ving from the band Fear, who plays Piggy in that. Uh, and Lou, and what's great is everybody but Lou Reed sings the same song, but they have a blues band a rock band, uh, they have a punk band, and every band ends up singing the same song in this movie uh, in a totally different way, which makes it great. But Lou uh, does the song where he decides to come out of, return, uh, out of retirement because the person who's holding this concert is going to die, and he writes uh, the song Little Sister, which he wrote for his sister. And it is a, once again, looking at the softer side of Lou, uh, who says, you know, you know, it's hard for me. I cannot use the phone and in the shape of publicity. Yeah, I know I don't look well. Time has not been good to me, but please believe me. The blame is on me. I've always loved my baby sister. Remember when we were younger, you would wait for me at school, teachers, friends, and brazen sins, and I was often cruel, but you always believed in me. You thought that I was the best, and now that I've got you alone, let me get this off my chest. Pick a melody, then count from one to ten. I'll make up a rhyme and we'll try again. To laugh or cry or give a sigh to a past that might have been and how much I really love my baby sister. Again, Lou was a phenomenal poet, even without music. If you have a sister, especially one that you feel may be disappointed in you, how could that song not affect you? It wasn't on any of his regular albums. It actually showed up on a collection called... Um, on Between Thought and Expression, which was a box set. And that's where um, I was happy to get it because I had seen it in the movie Get Crazy. But Baby Sister, uh, let's take, uh, sorry, Little Sister. Um, so let's take a listen to Little Sister by Lou Reed, an ode to his uh, sister, Meryl. All right, moving into number seven, one of my top three all-time uh, Lou Reed favorite songs and my 
uh, tie for first favorite album from the album New York 1989. Um, this was his 15th solo album. It was released in 1999 to a May, uh, sorry, 1989 to broad critical acclaim. Um, he built upon his theme of documenting the New York City underbelly and its most stigmatized and downtrodden residents. It is regarded as his most conceptual album. And from the liner notes, Reed instructs himself and listeners to take the whole album in, in one city. It's simple music, so it doesn't distract from the lyrics. Um, it is, uh, in many reviews, considered the finest album of a solo career. It's a mix of sharp detail, righteous anger, and razor wire rock. It is number 70 on the 100 greatest um, albums of all time. My favorite line from this song, give me your hungry, you're tired, you're poor, I'll piss on them. That's what the statue of bigotry says. Your poor huddled masses, let's club them to death, get it over with, and just dump them on the boulevard. Let's listen to Dirty Boulevard by Lou Reed. Number eight, also from the same album of the same title, Halloween Parade. Uh, the Halloween Parade is an annual festivity in New York City, and it uh, has been heavily attended by the LGBTQ community especially back in the 70s and 80s, because it was the chance to be the one day you could be yourself in this parade and dress up. And it was a huge celebration. And the song is about this parade in the village and how AIDS had vanquished so many of the participants and Lou looking at the parade and realizing how many friends he's lost. Um, there ain't no Harry and no Virgin Mary. You won't hear those voices again. And Johnny Rio and Rotten Rita You'll never see those faces again. Halloween is something to be sure, especially without you. The celebration somehow gets me down when I see that you're not around. So it's a really emotional song. And it is, I think, one of the most brilliant tip of the hats to the amazing people that this horrible disease has taken. And Lou taking a moment to sit back on a joyous day and to mourn all the friends that he's lost from this disease. So I also chose the live version of this, which is from the re-release of uh, the New York album, because I think while the pre-recorded version is amazing, this version has even a little bit more uh, heart and soul to it. And I think you can definitely hear the pain and emotion in his voice as he sings this. So without further ado, number eight from the album, New York Halloween Parade. All right, moving forward, we go to 1991. Um, I uh, picked Magic and Loss, and the Magic and Loss itself is a great album and one that I encourage you again to check out. Uh, the version I'm playing is a slightly different version of Magic and Loss, and it is from the Until the End of the Earth soundtrack by Vim Vendors, who Lou was a huge fan of. Um, it was originally intended to be about the themes of magic after hearing stories about the magicians in Mexico. Although tragedy struck during the writing process, um, Andy Warhol passed away, and um, that really affected him. And he decided it was uh, after losing that and another very close friend of his to cancer that um, he wanted to write an album about loss and illness and mortality. And at this point, not knowing that he would be taken by that same disease. Um, you know, less than uh, 20 years later. Uh, no, yeah, not even 15, almost 12 years later. So, um, it would have been very easy for a project like this to sound morbid, but, but Lou avoids that. The emotion that dominates these songs are fear and helplessness in the face of a disease and a fate that is not understood and that death is part of life and that you can't have magic without loss. Um, he spent a lot of time working on this album. He had guitarist Mike Rathke, bassist Bob Wasserman, percussionist Michael Blair. He approaches the music um, with memorable tunes that are pulled out of its mid-tempo rut. I love what's good. It's got a phenomenal bass line and just great stuff. Gaston Stokes has got a really great guitar line. It's a really beautiful album. Um, it's groundbreaking in the fact that it is 
all these songs are linked together, but not in a way that you expect. It is a very reflective album. And if you have lost somebody to cancer, another horrible disease, um, in a moment of introspection, I encourage you to listen to this album and its lyrics and see how it affects you and see if it helps you to see the magic that can be found in loss. So um, let's take a listen to uh, what's good. Sanskrit red to a pony. Sorry, Sanskrit red to a pony. Bacon and ice cream. That's like life without you. Things that just don't make sense. It's so great. Moving on to number 10. Uh, we take a look at his last solo project in 2003. Um, he interpreted Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Um, uh, and particularly a song on there that I really love is The Vanishing Act. Because at this point, Lou Reed, uh, Lou knew that he was dying and uh that cancer was probably going to overtake him he was fighting it but um it definitely infected his psyche at the time so it is based on short stories and poems he has people like laurie anderson uh who he was married to at the time david bowie steve buscemi willem dafoe there's other great people who step up and speak on this there was an amazing remake of perfect day uh, that was completely reimagined for this album that is haunting and dark and slightly atonal, but really unique. Uh, in the liner notes to the album, Lou touches on some of the parallels between their work when he writes, uh, he and Edgar Allan Poe's work, when he says, I have reread and rewritten Poe to ask the same question again that he asked, who am I? Why am I drawn to do what I should not? Why do we love what we cannot have why do we have passion for exactly the wrong thing? At this point, like I said, Lou was battling cancer and must have known he would lose. So the song and the poem, Vanishing Act, I really feel hold even greater meaning. So, um, yeah, it must be nice to disappear, to have a vanishing act, to always be looking forward and never over your back. Must be nice to disappear, float into the mist with a young lady on your arm, looking to kiss. I want to know, young Poe. Lou Reed with uh, Vanishing Act number 10, and then I will come back with a bonus track. Number 11. All right, number 11, our bonus track and my final uh, pick. Uh, I save to the end because you're not going to want to listen to this whole 16-minute track. It is... Um, Lou Reed's Metal Machine Music. And I love this because Lou had huge success with his uh, second album, Transformer. It took off huge. And he said, you know what? Now that I've had a pop hit, everybody's going to go buy my next album. Um, so I want to screw with them and make sure that only the people that really love me and want to listen to my music and really care what I have to say as an artist are listening and not just a bunch of people are going to buy it because they want to say, oh, I bought the new Lou Reed album. So uh, it's also at this time that he was moved to RCA's Red Seal label, which was generally reserved for classical acts. And they gave him a lot of money to do this album. So Lou decided to do not even a single album, but a double album of four 16-minute long tracks of feedback and noise. Not a single vocal, a few yelps and howls, but it is, um, there is no song, there's no recognizably structured compositions, there's no melody, no rhythm, it's just modulated feedback and noise, guitar effects, and mixed at varying speeds. It is Nothing but, as uh, Rolling Stone put, ear-wrecking electronic sludge guaranteed to clear out any room of humans in record time. Now, Lester Bangs, who was a uh, amazing critic for Cream Magazine, I've talked about him before, he's in the music, uh, he's in the movie Almost Famous, um, said, as classical music, it adds nothing to a genre that may as well be depleted. As rock and roll, it's interesting garbage, electronic rock, and as a statement, it's great. As a giant fuck you, as it shows integrity to a sick, twisted, dunced out, malevolent, malevolent, perverted, psychopathic industry that does not care, but yet integrity nevertheless. He wrote a whole tongue-in-cheek article on it, said it was the greatest album ever made. 
He judged it. Uh, he also voted it for his best rock, blues, R&B, and jazz single for the year and said that when he had a hangover, he would put it in the eight-track player of his car and play it, and it would clear out his head faster than a cigarette and a uh, Bloody Mary. So um, I'm going to tell you, if you can make it through more than three or four minutes of this, you are uh, a true rock aficionado. I then encourage you to go check out bands like Known and The Litanies of Satan by Diamanda Galas. Also, if you're looking for great music that if your neighbor upstairs or downstairs is creating a commotion and you want to get them to shut up, try Litanies of Satan by Diamanda Galas, followed by Known. And if that doesn't work, play all four sides of this. Anyways, um, the short of it is don't make an album if you're a heroin junkie and given a ton of time and money to do whatever it is you want because you're going to spend most of it on drugs and end up with an album that sounds like this so without any further ado first of all i want to thank everybody we'll, we'll we'll do a close out but here's uh metal machine music i don't expect you to get to the end so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say goodbye now and say hey thanks for listening make sure to check out our previous episodes we did an awesome interview with marco peroni we're working on some more interviews for you and uh stay tuned because peter's going to be back for our next episode a huge surprise and one that I know many of you have been asking for. So we're very excited. So from all of us here at 10 Songs, I'm Stephen Rose. Thanks for joining. And without any further ado, let's see how far you make it through this. Lou Reed, Metal Machine Music.